Living Waters presents On the Box. Welcome to the Wednesday edition of On the Box. Sitting in for Tony, I am Belvedere. And I am Abbott. <laughs> and we want to welcome you to today's program. Eddie? Yes. <laughs> on the Box. And who's that guy? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we got that something one. exciting going on other than our new uh, hosts, <laughs> if you can call them that. Um, on the Box is now available on iTunes. That's right, you can go to iTunes and uh, get yourself uh, all the podcasts and, and listen to them. It's an audio format, but um, you know it's, it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. The easiest way to do this, the easiest way to find these, pi these uh, podcasts is to go to, lower third please, www.lwpaudio.com. That's lwpaudio.com. That kind of hurt. Graphic right in the face. Okay. Uh, I, I imagine that stands for Living Waters Productions Audio.com. Lwpaudio.com. If you go there, you can get plugged right into our podcast. Now you do need to have iTunes on your computer, okay, in order for for this all to work. But iTunes is free. So again. LWPAudio.com. Very well done, Eddie. Very well done. Thank you for that. Thanks. Cut. Cut. Give <laughs> <laughs> <That's laughs> me my notes back, too. Very I'm smooth. Well done. The I long arm of the law yes. going into the other studio. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, it's really you guys. Do you want to introduce the dummies? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we already did. <laughs> I say we just move on. Yeah, let's just move on. <laughs> well, wait. Now, come on. Tell them why you got Al and Belvedere. Well, You've even named them. Yeah, um, about six months ago, someone gave me a dummy. You've seen him. It's Ernie. We've had him on the oh, program we, a long time ago. So I took him open air preaching at uh, <laughs> Huntington Beach. He didn't say much, but just standing there, he seemed to attract a crowd. So, oh, we came to the right size. That's great. So Scotty... Um, Squirrel! <laughs> Squirrel. So Scotty said to me, you know, we should get some more. So I found online where I could buy Albert Einstein and uh, a butler. And so I just got to figure out how to get them. Get them on my bike to Huntington Beach or into Scotty's car because Scotty can want to side car. That bike. might do, yeah. yeah. But yeah, people people just love them. Then you uh, could uh, ride your bike in the Diamond Lane. Yeah. Please video that. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you went over to Cerritos today. How did that go? I didn't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know why we produced the video we're going to start with today, mm. but I don't question my leader's judgment. <laughs> I'm sure there is a reason. Well, do, do we produce that, or do we just like get well, it from Well, it's up on else? the living. It's up on the way of the master uh, YouTube channel, so I assume. Is this the we're uh, is this the not raise hand thing? Not raise hand. Yeah, we just felt we needed a disclaimer because I used to watch that and shudder, and so it's a little tongue and cheek disclaimer. So let's. So take a look it. at this tongue and cheek disclaimer. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm no <a> disclaimer. <laughs> Do you ever wonder why you're going to die? Why I'm going to die? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's nature. You never think about it? No. So there's, if there was one chance in a million <laughs> that Jesus Christ has abolished death as the Bible says he has, then you owe it to your good sense just to look into it, don't you? No. The Bible. <laughs> you've, got, you've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? No arm, Ray. <laughs> All right. Today's, so, <laughs> today's evangelism tip is not to caress the men you are witnessing to. Yes. That's the that, long arm of the law. It just right. looked horrible, didn't it? I mean, at one point, there was a little pinchy going yeah, on yeah, there. Don't right pinch me, Ray. <laughs> don't, don't, don't pinch me, Ray. What's that? Don't uh, tase me, bro. <laughs> Ray, you have a very long arm. All right, so on the box of living com, on the box of living com, on the box of living com, if you have any comments about Ray's hand. But that was not Ray's hand. No. That was not your hand. That was the disclaimer. That was the disclaimer. Can you prove that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to something uh, a little more serious, mm -hmm. shall we? You ready, Eddie? Uh, yeah. Okay. After that, I'm ready. 
Is there a creative way to use blasphemy? Now, hang on. Let's finish that sentence. <laughs> I'm going to. I'm going to. But even though, even the way this, the sentence is worded, it's still not going to come out right, but I'm going to use it. Anyway. Is there a creative way to use blasphemy as a springboard into the gospel? Examples, I'm surrounded by it, meaning blasphemy. He hears blasphemy all the time. So I figure there's got to be a good way to transition others speaking blasphemously into the gospel. Can you think of one? Have you ever given out tracks and people have been so delighted with the track they use blasphemy when they get them? I've had yes, that. It's yes. a horrible feeling. I kind of caused it. You know, but yeah, what I do is when someone blasphemes, we still I want you to get our tracks though. Yes. It doesn't cause blasphemy in no, everybody. Not everybody. Um, <laughs> I just put in my memory banks when someone uses blasphemy, and then I try and witness to that person, and then bring the subject up and say, "I heard you before. What do you do?" Uh, I like to use an analogy. Um, I don't know if I learned it from you. No, I did learn it from you. Okay. I've learned so much from you. <laughs> uh, this is through the. Well, what book was it? Uh, what not? What Hollywood believes? Um, uh, Hollywood be thy name. Yes. Hollywood be yeah, thy name. I've read that one. And. Uh, <laughs> wrote that one. Oh. And read it. You wrote it faster than I could read it. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> squirrel. Uh, you asked the people on Hollywood Boulevard, uh, you know, who was a person that was important to them. They would say maybe their mom or their dad. Let's say you went into the movie house uh, with uh, a person you love. You sit down to the movie. You, you're buying the popcorn and the soda. And about five minutes into the movie, one of the main characters uses your loved one's name as a punchline to a dirty joke. Yeah. A few minutes later, another character uses your loved one's name as a filthy curse word. And then every few minutes throughout the movie, one character after another throws your loved one's name around as if it's dirt or of no value. Would that offend you? Mm. Uh, nine times out of ten, they say yes. Would it offend the loved one you took to the movie? Well, yes, it would. Well, that's what happens when we take God's name in vain. Have you seen the YouTube clip on that? Yes. We're, we've got it. We should grab it for tomorrow's show. It's interesting. It shows people seize their conscience and yeah. doing, doing its work. Yeah. What do you do, Eddie? You know, I think it basically comes down to people just don't think it's that big a deal. Uh, oftentimes, yeah, so pastors don't think it's well that yeah, big a deal. People who believe in God, they still use blasphemy. And, and what I try to do is just to, to give them a little analogy that, that shows them, you know, the, the seriousness of it. And, and so I call it the, uh, the piece of cotton analogy. So anyway, imagine you had a, uh, a piece of cotton, just a, a cloth, and you were to take that piece of cotton, let's say it's colored blue, and you would just take it and drag it through the mud. Would anyone care? Well, no. No one would care. They'd think you're weird, but they wouldn't care. What if we took that same cotton, and this time it's colored red, white, and blue. It has stripes and stars on it, and now it's the American flag. What if we were to take that piece of cotton and drag it through the mud? Well, people would care, and it's not because of the cotton, it's what that cotton represents. And when we take our words, a lot of people say, well, they're just words. Well, it's not just the words, it's what those words represent. We're taking the name of the holy God who's given us life, and we're dragging it through the mud, okay? And so I think we just need to sh show people the seriousness of what it is they're doing when they're blaspheming. There you go. Now I thought he was going to say, take the cotton, and then you'd uh, take <coughs> dental floss and drag it through the mud, and, but uh, that would have ruined that analogy. <laughs> That would make Dental sense. Floss? Yeah. yeah. I missed that? I missed that. <laughs> no, you missed it. I did. Okay. Yes, you weren't listening. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we do not recommend walking up to people and saying, Blasphemer! That's no. not a really good way to... No. Anita's in the room again. <laughs> Anita's critiquing our work again. Mm -hmm. Refuses to come on camera, but she? she's over We've there We've never heckling. seen her. We That's don't know if she's really there. No, I, I do have some film footage of Anita reading a newspaper <laughs> instead of evangelizing at Cerritos College. Ooh. I do have that. Saving that for a rainy day. Yeah. All right, speaking of rainy days, it rained during the Reason Rally. Oh, it did, yes. It did. Yeah. But not enough uh, to keep the uh, three or four atheists who showed up. Uh, they, they expected 20,000. There was probably half of that, probably about 10,000. Mm. And there were... Uh, they didn't have enough faith. They didn't have enough. Mm -hmm. They, they should have, have been speaking it, naming right. it, claiming it. Well, there were, <laughs> <laughs> there were at least 100 evangelists who had enough faith to go there and share the gospel. Oh, that's that great. Cool. And so we've got a short clip of one open air from the Reason rally. Take a look. So welcome to the Reason Rally Bible study. We got about a good 25 minute Bible study planned out here for you. We're in Romans chapter 1. 
So if you atheists have your Bibles with you, let's open them up to Romans chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 18. And it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which can be known about God is evident within you, because God made it evident to you. Here we go. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, that men are without excuse. But they, uh, because they that knew God, they glorified him not, nor were they thankful. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into that like the corruptible man, or four-footed beast, or birds, or creeping things. No. They, they changed the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creation rather than the creator. That's what you guys do. Can you preach You worship and serve the creation rather than the creator. Yeah, well, okay. For this cause, God gave them up under their vile affections. For even the women did exchange the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men burned in their lust one toward another, men with men doing that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with fire and brimstone, and that was not God's wrath poured out full strength. The entire globe, except for eight people and an ark of animals, was destroyed in the days of Noah. And folks, that was not God's wrath poured out full strength. But there's coming a day when God is going to judge the world in righteousness. In righteousness. Folks, you understand, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah didn't even have a Bible to read. And God judged them severely. In Noah's day, they didn't even have a Bible to read. And God judged them severely. So America's condemnation will be so great. Not only are you guys not properly using your time, money, and effort to glorify God, but you're standing here like an insignificant little speck on a tiny planet, shaking your fist up at the God of the universe, telling him you're in charge and you know better. And there's coming a day, folks, there's coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Folks, I can't wait for that day. I can't wait for the day that I get to see Jesus face to face and bow my knee and confess that he's Lord straight to his face. It's going to be wonderful because I've already declared it down here on earth. But folks, that Jesus Christ is Lord. I bow my knee. I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. But folks, if you take your last breath as an unrepentant sinner, you die, you walk off into eternity as an unrepentant sinner, shaking your fist up at the God of the universe, you, you still will bow your knees, your tongue will still confess that he's Lord, but you're going to do it in sheer terror, because the Bible says his angels will bind you hand and foot. If you will humble yourself before God, turn from your sin, and trust alone in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you can be made right again with God. But folks, we're here to warn you. We're not out here to hand you bottled water and smiley face stickers. We're out here to give you a warning that God is going to pour out one thing upon you or another. Either on this side of eternity, he's willing to pour out his grace and his mercy upon you. If you will repent of your sins and trust alone in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, if you will not turn, if you will not turn, I want to apologize to our viewers for one of those last images on that video the man in the black Wait, skirt with the uneven socks. No, that no, no, was no, no. troubling. No. no, it was either a man in a kilt. Or a woman with uh, a beard. Kilts are usually plaid. Or a woman with a beard. Kilts are plaid. I say we just kilts skirt are not that all together. Black. That was I, a skirt. That I was clearly was, a skirt. It was. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it wasn't a woman with a beard. It was not a woman with a beard. It was a man in a skirt. That okay. was Harry. That was Harry. Okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, shouldn't we say something about the preaching? <laughs> Would you like? I to? thought the guy did very well. He wasn't. Um, he wasn't angry. Which is often no. uh, people get like that up in their preaching, especially in a, with atheists around. So he did very well. Yeah, but he didn't get a good heckler. Did you hear that? Uh, hear that Eric Hovind went toe to toe with uh, Thunderfoot. 
Oh, he did? Our twice guest here at the Ministry of Thunderfoot. Thunder Toes. Thunder Toes. He's, t he's too nice. He's, he's not a Thunderfoot. Nice. He's, he's nice. just a he's sweet he's guy. He's, he's nasty on video, but you get him into our building and he he's seems he to melts. soften up. Yeah, I yeah. love the guy. Yeah. But anyways, uh, he and Eric went around about for about a half hour or so. I think there's some video out there of, of them too. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. All right. Uh, question. Uh, my brother's father-in-law is a veteran of our police force here in Talladega, Alabama. He said so many times, he has said many times that there couldn't be a God because of the things he has seen people do to each other. Could you give me some advice on how to witness to him that God is real and this is a fallen world? The law doesn't seem to convict him because his heart is so hard. Please help. What do you think? <coughs> well, firstly, don't ever say the law doesn't seem to convict him because the Bible says your labor is not in vain. It's always profitable to share God's word with someone. Even though you don't see some results, it's going right down to the, the marrow of the bones. God's word is quick and powerful, sharp than two-edged sword. So don't demean the seed that God has given you to plant because he's the one that, uh, that saves sinners. So take great consolation in that. God's do word doesn't return void. Um, what I would do is obviously God exists because of creation. You can't have a creation without a creator. But I would say the very thing that's offending him is exactly what the Bible confirms. Man is wicked by heart. So he looks around and sees the wickedness of man. He's confirming God's testimony of man in his word. Hmm. Eddie? Well, you know, he's basically saying, I don't think God exists because look at all this, this evil, this crime that's happening. And I would ask him, are you capable of committing a crime? You know, could you commit a crime, any crime, and if you were to commit a crime, would that prove that a judge doesn't exist? Would your crime, you know, that you do prove that God doesn't exist just because of what you do? Well, of course not. doesn't make sense, you know? And, you know, in Romans chapter 1, it says the reason people, you know, pretend that God doesn't exist is because they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. In other words, they're pretending God doesn't exist because of their own sin, you know, as, as a, a, a person who works in law enforcement, I would ask him, so, you know, why are you spending your whole life, you know, even risking your life doing law enforcement when ultimately there's no justice? You know, if there's no God, there can be no ultimate justice. There can just be man making up rules. And sometimes you like these rules. Sometimes you don't. You know, what if you were to move over to Afghanistan? Would you like the rules over there? You know, wha so, so it all comes down to either there's ultimate justice or there's not. You know, your, your father-in-law isn't seeing the big picture. These guys who are doing this stuff that he hates, well, they're on their way to hell, you know? So it's, it's not like they're getting away for it from anything. You know, you know the, the fact that evil exists is consistent with what the Bible teaches. Yeah. I'd also ask his father-in-law, what would he like God to do about it? Is he, would he like to send lightning to strike them? You know, does he want judgment day now? And then go back to the law and say, if God has judgment day now, he's also in big trouble because if he hates someone in God's eyes, he's a murderer, adulterer, etc. if he's got lust in his heart. So yeah. just say that God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. And that's why he's holding back his wrath upon these evil men that he knows are doing wrong because God has given him a sense of uh, conscience. And uh, the law could very well be getting to your father-in-law's heart, uh, those in law enforcement and having been among them for 20 years as a deputy, I can assure you that they are very good at putting on stone faces while they are raging or weeping or dying on the inside. Uh, they're very good at uh, detaching themselves from what's going on in front of them. They have to do that in order to be able to uh, stay alive, stay functional, stay sane, uh, mm. seeing everything they see out there on the streets. Um, I would use a courtroom analogy with your father-in-law, and uh, I would change it a little bit. There's probably no place more fearful for a law enforcement officer than being seated at the defense table in a courtroom. Uh, we spend all of our time at the prosecution table because we have written reports, we've made arrests, we are seeking the conviction of the person sitting at the defense table, uh, but there is nothing as frightening for a law enforcement officer to be accused of doing something wrong, uh, whether it's excessive force or lying on a report or something mm. else and finding yourself <coughs> being the one on trial. Right. Uh, we know what goes on in jails. It's usually not a healthy place for law enforcement uh, professionals to be inside uh, the bars of those jails. And uh, so we, we shudder the thought of being convicted of a crime and then being thrown into an environment with all the people we've put in jail. Mm. And so by using a courtroom analogy, putting your father-in-law at the defense table, having been found guilty of breaking the law, 
and uh, then someone coming in to pay his fine right. uh, is going uh, to think open his mind open his heart to then hear hear the gospel but law the uh, courtroom analogies work very very well with law enforcement because they're in courtrooms all the time <coughs> and they do have a sense of justice they're out there enforcing the law and uh, they would realize, uh, you know, if they deny that lying is wrong or stealing is wrong, they're contradicting everything they believe in and the very job that they do. And what the father-in-law is doing is nothing different than someone who says, what about happening in Nazi Germany? Right. That's just, uh, where is God? Why was God not in that? Well, God allows certain things to happen. He allows evil to happen. But he said, aside of that, but you'll judge the world in righteousness. So you have to keep the law on him, keep the heat on him. Uh, until he comes through. Yeah, it, you can ask your uh, <coughs> father-in-law, do you think that God should judge evil? Mm. Uh, should he judge the murderer, the rapist, uh, the, the pedophile, uh, the, the serial thief, or, or what have you? And having taken your father-in-law through the law, inevitably your father-in-law is going to say, yes, if God is good, he is going to judge evil. And you could say something like, well, you know, Dad, if uh, God were to judge all evil at noon today, where would that put you at 1201? Right. Keep your father-in-law in the law. That's right. Mm. Yeah. All right. Uh, next question. What is the moral law of God? This is submitted by someone who refers to themselves as the last Chinese-Irish samurai. <laughs> <laughs> the last one? I feel strangely normal right now. <laughs> that must be something. The last Chinese-Irish samurai asks, thank you for on the box. There seems to be a disagreement among the pastors at my church as to what exactly is the moral law of God. I always thought the moral law was, is the commandments. Others think that the moral law is not the commandments. Could you clarify this for me? What is God's moral law? Well, I take a look at it in Romans chapter 2. Paul not only talks about the law, but then he opens up the law. Uh, Jesus uh, not only mentions it, but he opens it up. So um, it's obviously the Ten Commandments. Eddie? Well, I think the moral law is just anything, you know, talking about in the Old Testament, just anything referring to morality and the laws of God. And, of course, the most popular is Exodus chapter 20, where we have the Ten Commandments, and it's just very, very clearly spelled out. You know, when you get mess, messed up between the civil law, law ceremonial law, and moral law, you get confused, but that, that's how it can be broken up. 613 precepts in God's law, the moral, that is the Ten Commandments, the civil, that is the criminal law given to Israel, the Hebrews, to, to carry out justice, and the ceremonial law, that which they should do around the tabernacle, etc. Yeah. In the end, God's moral law is uh, the very reflection of his perfect and holy character. And that's what's written on our heart, that's or the work heart. of it is written on the heart by yeah. the conscience. Yeah, some would try to differentiate <coughs> what is written on the heart of the unbeliever and the law given uh, in the Ten Commandments to the Jews, and, and that is unfortunate that some try to do that. It, they're making a huge mistake. Yeah. You know, it, to say that it, there's a different law written on the heart of the Gentile, the, the question that uh, begs to be asked is, well, what's the standard? Yeah. If it's not God's moral law, if it's not the Ten Commandments, what is the standard, or is it just left to everyone? And how is God going to judge thieves and liars and uh, if blasphemers there's not a standard. and adulterers if there's not the standard of the Ten Commandments? What other law has he got? Yeah. Okay. Crazy. All right. Uh, last question. I think we got time. I grew up in a Christian home and was baptized in my late teens. But while in university, I began to drift. Looking back now, I know I was not a quote-unquote good soil believer. But a few months ago, I realized that I wasn't right with God and repented of my sins before him. Now I know I am right with God. Recently, I've started to question myself on the issue of baptism. I know that we are supposed to be baptized as believers. Should I be baptized again? What would the implications of this be? I'm asking a few people that I trust with what their thoughts are on this, and I'd love to hear your opinion. What would the implications be? He'd get wet. Seriously, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going to be on CNN. You just get baptized. Um, if you have that conviction that you should get baptized, then you should. If, you'd, if it's no big deal, you wouldn't probably even question it. But, yeah, if, you, if it keeps coming back to your mind and you felt that you weren't baptized as a believer the first time, then he that believes and is baptized should be saved. I would. There's no harm done. You're just going to get wet and dry yourself off. Uh, baptism is for believers. And if you were baptized as a teenager, as a false convert, as an unbeliever, all you did was take a bath. Yeah. You took a dip in a pool. That's it. It means nothing. It means nothing spiritually. It means nothing morally. It, it means nothing whatsoever if you were baptized as an unbeliever. Uh, God's word commands that baptizers uh, that believers to be baptized, not as a means of grace, not as a means of salvation, but as a public 
a declaration of the salvation you have already right. received. And so out of obedience to Jesus Christ, you should be baptized, not again, but for the first time as a genuine follower of Christ. What are the implications? Other false converts in your church could hear your testimony, That's a good thought. see that, uh, wait a minute, I thought uh, Johnny was a Christian all these years. Now he's saying he's not. What is he talking about repentance and turning from my sin and putting my trust in Christ? I've never heard this in church before. That's a good point. Ask you know. a pastor who's baptizing if you can give a short word as to why, why this is happening. Exactly. Now, I've, I've run into the situation, unfortunately, where pastors have refused mm -hmm. to baptize people who they once baptized as a false convert, uh, but now refuse to baptize them now that they've come to genuine repentance and faith in Christ. And uh, without knowing the pastor's hearts, I'd have to say it's pride. Mm. They don't want the church to know that uh, they didn't see a false convert in their midst. And uh, they baptized him once, and they don't think they don't want to baptize him again. Mm. Um, some pastors have gone as far as to say, ah, oh, you've done that already. Don't worry about oh, yeah. it. Uh, time to find a new pastor, I think. But mm. I, I've baptized all three of my daughters, and I've baptized one of them twice. Was it publicly or just in private? Publicly, oh, yeah, yeah, as I was uh, pastoring. Mm. And... Uh, uh, I baptized one of them twice. Uh, she made a profession of faith uh, uh, earlier in life. Uh, she admitted that she had done so to make Dad happy. There wasn't any real change in her life. Realized that she wasn't a believer. Came to genuine repentance and faith in Christ. And I had the privilege of baptizing her again. And her testimony before our church family was a wonderful testimony of God's grace and the reality that there are false converts among us. I, uh, years ago, tried to organize a baptism with, uh, between three pastors, um, Pastor Wade, Dunk, and Bridges. And, uh, but Dunk was out of town, and Bridges had a bad back, so it never came to pass. It would have been historical Wade, Dunk, and Bridges water baptism. I was a new convert. Any help? Uh, there's no help for that one. Whoa! No, actually, Whoa! <laughs> no, actually you know, I was baptized as a, as a child, um, but, you know, years later when I got saved, I got baptized because... I was saved at that point. You know, the one, the one before didn't mean anything to me. Uh, my, one of my sons came to me a, a while ago and said, Dad, I want to get uh, baptized. And I said, well, you know, you got baptized a few years ago. And my son asked me, well, do you remember, did I do that because I wanted to do it or because you wanted me to do it? Yeah. And I said, well, you probably should get baptized So if, you, if you're not sure. And if uh, you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, you are living in disobedience. Uh, you need to be baptized, not because it earns you anything, but out of love and obedience for the Lord Jesus Christ and to have that opportunity to publicly testify to what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life. Until tomorrow, be encouraged, strengthened, and unafraid. Proclaim the gospel. Presents on the box.